Hello. Welcome to Living Hope Church Online, brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Hillary, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Today, Monday, the 12th of August, 2024, I am grateful to God that we can continue our series on enjoying our unlimited God, enjoying our unlimited God. Today's topic is enjoying our unlimited God, the God of providence, enjoying our unlimited God, the God of providence. You see, a lot of people believe that many events and circumstances merely happen by chance or by coincidence. When people believe that certain events and circumstances merely happen by chance or by coincidence, what they are saying is that such events and circumstances have nothing to do with God. They believe that such events are a matter of mere luck or good luck or bad luck. But you see, the Bible teaches us very clearly that nothing happens just by chance or by mere coincidence. Nothing happens merely as a matter of good luck or bad luck. Everything happens either because God permits it or causes it directly. This idea is very difficult to understand because everyone is responsible for their own actions and decisions. There is a lot of evil events in the world. There are natural disasters. There are also moral disasters. Natural disasters are disasters which happen by nature. For instance, flood, earthquake, volcanic eruptions, and so on and so forth. But moral disasters are disasters that happen because of the actions and decisions of human beings. Accidents happen. Many tragedies are caused by human actions. So if everything happens either because God permits it or God causes it directly, does that mean that God is responsible for every natural disaster? Does that mean that God is responsible for every wicked human action? This is a good question. We know for sure that God is good and that he does no evil at all. God does no evil at all. God is good at all times. At the same time, we know that God is unlimited. God is in absolute control of all events and circumstances in life. There is nothing that is beyond the power and purpose of God. Not even the evil of natural disasters or the evil caused by human beings. The fact is, we can never totally explain or understand why our unlimited God, who is absolutely good, causes or permits evil things to happen. But we know that when God created everything, God declared that it was perfect. In fact, it was perfectly good. What was perfectly good became ruined when sin entered, when sin occurred. So it was sin that ruined everything. And whatever we see today in terms of the conflict between good and evil, 
we can trace it back to the fact that everything was perfect until sin occurred. So basically, sin causes natural and moral imperfections. Sin causes natural and moral imperfections. The consequences of sin are natural disasters and moral imperfections. But God is still absolutely good. God is still absolutely good. And God has complete control in all aspects of life. Therefore, although sin is very prevalent, sin is very common, sin abounds. At the same time, nothing happens by chance or by coincidence. Nothing happens by mere luck or misfortune. I know it is very difficult for us to understand this, but from the perspective of God, nothing happens by accident. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens randomly. Nothing happens by coincidence. Everything happens either because God permits it or God causes it directly. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. Isaiah 45, verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, this is what God has to say. Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. There is no one who can deliver from my hand. What an awesome God we serve. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 13, God says, Who can stop me from doing whatever I want to do? And who can reverse any action of mine? I am God and there is no order. Amen. Amen. So the question today is, how does God work out his own good purposes, despite all the evil in the world? How does God work out his own good purposes, despite all the natural disasters and the tragedies caused by human beings? I have a very straightforward answer for us today. In all situations, God achieves his own plans and purposes through his providence. In all situations, God achieves, he achieves his own plans and purposes through his providence. God's absolute sovereignty is fittingly combined with his providence. God's absolute sovereignty is fittingly combined with his providence. Through God's providence, every single situation works towards God's perfect goals and purposes. No matter the wickedness of human beings, no matter the bad choices, no matter the mistakes, no matter the evil that we see all around us in the world at large, guess what? Through God's providence, every single situation works towards God's perfect goals and purposes. We all know what the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. This is what the Bible says. And we know 
that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. However, whether in this life or in the life to come, God will certainly reward the righteous and punish the wicked. I really want us to be clear about that. Whether in this present life or in the life to come, God will surely, God will certainly reward the righteous and punish the wicked. Isaiah chapter 3. Verses 10 to 11. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. When you look around, whether in your own family or in your own country or in your own neighborhood, or whether you look at the events and circumstances happening in the world at large, just go and consider human history. You will see that this is largely true. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings, and woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, no matter how long it takes, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. I, the Lord, I search the heart, I test the mind, even to give everyone according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11, this is what God says. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and we lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11. God says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and we lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. That's why Moses told the children of Israel that their choices and decisions matter. Our choices and decisions matter. Moses told the children of Israel who are in covenant relationship with God that listen very carefully. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 to 20. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 to 20. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have said before you life and death blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Choose life that both you and your descendants may live. How would they know that they have chosen life? That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for God is your life and the length of your days. If you choose life by loving God, then you will dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Can you begin to understand why it's important for each one of us to love God? If you choose life, you will know if I choose life, I will know. Choose life by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice. 
by clinging to him. For God is your life and the length of your days. When you choose life, you will dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. If God would speak to the children of Israel through Moses like that, how much more all of us who are born again through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As God's children through Christ Jesus, our choices and decisions matter too. Our choices and decisions matter. See what the Lord Jesus says to us in John chapter 14, verse 21. John 14, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. I remember when I became born again, this was an important promise of God that I would usually use in my prayer. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. So I normally would pray, and I still continue to pray like that till today. Let me show that I love you by keeping your commandments, O God. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. That's why, by the grace of God, I can genuinely say to you, in his mercy, our Heavenly Father is my dearest friend. Our Heavenly Father is the one who loves me best. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him. And there are many, many situations in my life where God, in his mercy through Christ Jesus, has proven to me how much he loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I really am grateful to God that I can say to you that this is true. The Lord Jesus will manifest himself to you in so many ways. You will know that indeed the Lord Jesus is in your life. Amen. Come with me to John chapter 14 from verse 23 to 24 again. Just let us listen to the Lord Jesus. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him through the blessed Holy Spirit. You will know when you have the Holy Spirit in you, and you will know when you are following the Holy Spirit, when you are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because all that you will seek to do is to please God. That will be your natural default position. That will be your natural state of mind. You don't have to stress about it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to scratch your head about it. It will just be your natural state of mind, wanting to please God rather than yourself, wanting to do what is right in the sight of God rather than doing what is right in your own sight, going back to God constantly to ask, Lord, what can I do? What should I do in this situation? That's to show what Jesus is saying in John chapter 14, verses 23 to 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the fathers who sent me. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help us. It's so easy, it's so straightforward to know 
whether we are born again or not. And if we are genuinely born again, it's so easy to know whether we are walking according to the Spirit of God or according to our own flesh in whatever situation we find ourselves. You don't need anybody to preach this to you. If genuinely you are born again, in every situation you will find out whether you are walking according to the Spirit of the Lord or you are walking after your own flesh. Amen. But the question today in today's broadcast is, how can we enjoy our unlimited God in a world that is often upside down? How can we enjoy our unlimited God in a world in which evil often seems to be outside the control of God? When you look around you, when you look at the world at large, when you look at what is happening in your country, it seems that evil is outside the control of God. The wicked people are just, you know, doing their wicked works without any accountability to God, and they seem to be getting away with it. That is the situation in the whole world. Not just in your neighborhood, not just in your country, not just in your family, Perhaps not just in your church. When people are wicked, they seem to be able to get away with it without any accountability to God. Sometimes that is what happens. Sometimes it seems they are outside the control of God. Sometimes it seems as if they know that God will not touch them. How then can we enjoy our unlimited God in a world like this, in a world in which it seems that chance applies, in a world in which it seems as if coincidences apply, in a world in which it seems as if it's all a matter of good luck or bad luck? How can we enjoy our unlimited God in such an upside down world? How can we enjoy our unlimited God in which events seem to happen randomly, as if by chance or by accident? How can we enjoy our unlimited God in a world in which events seem to happen randomly, as if by chance or by accident? How can we enjoy our unlimited God in a world in which even those of us who are born again children of God, sometimes our best actions only lead to pain and regrets? This is important for us. Even for those of us who are born again, who are doing our best to please God, on occasions, even our best effort will lead to pain and regret for us. You see that in the Bible as well. You will notice that in your life as well. I know that that happens to me in life. I'm grateful to God that today I can be sharing this with you. So, that is the focus of today's broadcast. Welcome to enjoying our unlimited God, the God of providence. Welcome to today's broadcast. Enjoying our unlimited God, the God of providence. From the beginning to the end, we see the providence of God throughout the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the outworking of God's providence throughout the Bible. We know that Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3. But we also see that God had already planned that through their sinful action, God will redeem the whole world. Adam and Eve sinned. 
in Genesis chapter 3, but we also notice throughout the Bible that God had already planned that through the sinful action of Adam and Eve, God would redeem the whole world. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God told Satan, the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The seed of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you read John chapter 3, verse 16, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, that for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were still without strength, in due time, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for the wicked, died for the sinners. So you see, as children of God, the providence of God is working constantly in our life one way or another. As children of God, even in the whole world, in the life of everyone, but particularly in our life as children of God, the providence of God is working constantly in our life. We see this throughout the Bible in the life of God's people. Everyone we read about in the Bible, whether they believe in God or not, whether they obey God or not, they are an example of God's providence. They are an example of God's providence. Nothing happens to anyone by coincidence. Nothing happens to anyone by chance. Whether they believe in God or not, even today, whether they've given their life to God or not through Christ Jesus. Everyone we read about in the Bible and in today's, in today's world, whether they believe in God or not, whether they obey God or not, everyone is an example of God's providence. But more so, those of us who are born again by our faith in Christ Jesus. Nothing happens to anyone by coincidence. Nothing happens to anyone randomly. Nothing happens to anyone by mere luck or bad luck. Everything is governed by God's providence. Nothing happens to anyone by coincidence. Nothing happens to anyone by chance. Nothing happens to anyone by accident. Nothing happens to anyone randomly. But more so, especially for those of us who are born again, everything is governed by the providence of God. Everything is governed by the providence of God. The sparrow that falls to the ground, the least hair on our head, that falls out, everything is governed by the providence of God. The grains of sand on the seashore, the movement of the planets, whether it rains or shines, everything is governed by the providence of God. From the least thing to the biggest thing in the world, from the smallest event to the biggest event in the world, from those who become billionaires and millionaires to those who have nothing. No matter what happens, everything is governed by the providence of God. Those who become famous and celebrities and those who remain anonymous and unknown, those who live in obscurity and poverty, whatever happens, 
whatever steps, whatever actions, whatever consequences of life that apply to all of us, everything is governed by the providence of God. Amen. Let me show us two important principles about the providence of God. Two important principles that you must know as a child of God. If you want to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence, two important principles that you must know. One, genuinely loving God and seeking to please him can even if we all do so imperfectly. The first principle, and make sure you walk to it. The first principle, if you are going to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence, genuinely loving God and seeking to please him can even if we all do so imperfectly even if we are all imperfect in loving God, in seeking to please him, but genuinely loving God and seeking to please him can. Look at the life of Noah. Was he perfect? Look at the life of Abraham. Was he perfect? Look at the life of Isaac, of Jacob, of Joseph, of David. Every man and woman of God in the Bible, and even in today's world, they are not perfect. But one thing distinguishes them. They genuinely love God and they seek to please him. You want to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence, genuinely love him and seek to please him. You see the request that the Lord gives us, the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see how he requires us to love him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Not only that, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see this in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 31. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 35, the Holy Spirit speaking through the apostle Peter, speaking through Peter, the Holy Spirit has this to say. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and walks righteousness is accepted by him. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears God and walks righteousness is accepted by him. So you can see that first principle is the foundational principle. If you want to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence, loving God and seeking to please him can It matters extraordinarily. Principle number two, God creates everyone only for his own goals and purposes. Principle number two, God creates everyone and everything, the planet, what you see, what you do not see, all the animals, all the plants, everything that God created, but especially us human beings. God created everything only for his own goals and purposes. God creates everyone only for his own goals and purposes. If you go to the book of Revelation, 
you'll see how the Bible puts it. Oh God, you created everything for your purpose and for your pleasure. And you can see it even in the book of Genesis, when God created human beings, when God created everything, it was, it was for his purpose and for his goals. Okay? So God creates everyone only for his own goals and purposes. But people often reject God's good goals and purposes for their life. It's important for you to understand this second principle as well. You want to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence? Take this second principle to heart. Apply it to your life. God creates everyone only for his own goals and purposes, but people often reject God's good goals and purposes for their life. Come with me to Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. The Lord was speaking about Pharaoh. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Some people read it, and they say it means God raised up Pharaoh to destroy him. But that is not what God is saying. God says, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. If Pharaoh listened to God, it would just be as powerful as when he rejected God. Okay? God would have shown his power in his life and through Pharaoh's obedience, God would have declared his own name in all the earth by saving the children of Israel. Can you begin to see what it is all about? Whatever way you choose to act, you cannot defeat God. So it's important for you to choose to act in a way that accords with the good goals and purposes of God for your life. Amen. We all have the choice to align ourselves with the purpose of God for our life. We all have the choice to stand with God for the good purpose of God for our life. Look at the case of Judas. Judas is carried who betrayed Jesus. Jesus said about him, it would have been better if he had not been born. Why? Because Judas chose to align himself with something that was contrary to the good purpose of God for his life. He chose it. We can't explain why. We can never explain it. But he chose it himself. So he was responsible for his own action. Pharaoh was responsible for his own action. I don't know how much I can emphasize this. God creates everyone for his own goal and purposes. But often, people choose to reject the good purpose and goals of God for their life. May that not be me. May that not be you. May we not reject the good purpose of God for our life. You will know it when you are rejecting it. It's just something that we can't explain. Why would anyone reject the good purpose of God for their life? Look at Numbers chapter 14, verses 21 to 23. The children of Israel, God told them he was taking them to the promised land. The old journey would only have lasted for 40 days. The old journey would only have lasted for 40 days. But they rejected God's good purpose for their life. So in Numbers chapter 14, from verse 21 to 23, 
This is what God says. Truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and they have put me to the test now these ten times, and they have not heeded my voice, they have not obeyed my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I saw to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. It's important for us to know that we are created for God's own purposes. We mustn't reject God's purpose for our life. We mustn't reject it. When we are rejecting it, we will know. When we walk out of God's will for our life, we will know. Fortunately, on many occasions, because of his great grace, his graciousness, when we walk out of his will in one respect, he allows us to enter into another aspect of his will in another way. Because we don't know all the goodnesses that God has reserved for us. So when we fall short in one, according to his mercy, we may just move on to something lesser, but at least we are still in the will of God. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help us so that we don't do what the children of Israel did. And God said, yeah, all of these people will perish in the wilderness. They will not see the good land that I had promised them. Come with me to Luke chapter 7, verse 30. Luke chapter 7, verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers, they rejected the will of God for themselves. The Pharisees and the lawyers, they rejected the will of God for themselves. So you can see a lot of people, they reject God's will for themselves. Why would anyone refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as the savior of the world? Why would anyone prefer to be a Muslim or a Buddhist or whatever religion that they choose compared to the sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ, compared to the work that he did on the cross when he died for all of us, for all our sins, compared to the evidence that he rose from the dead on the third day, proving that indeed he was the Son of God, the Messiah of the whole world, why would anyone reject Jesus Christ? The answer is, I don't understand. It's too strange. But that is important for us to know. Don't reject God's goal for your life. Don't reject God's good plans for your life. You will know when you are rejecting God's goals and God's good plans for your life. You will know. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit remind us of those two important principles. They are not seven principles. They are not ten principles. They are only two principles. So you should be able to remember them. Love God genuinely and seek to please him. It counts. As accept God's purpose for your life. Embrace God's purpose for your life. Don't walk out of God's will for your life. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help each one of us in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I have to finish today's broadcast on the second element, the second part of today's broadcast, which is what? Here it is. What practical steps must we take to enjoy God's providence? What practical steps must we take to enjoy God's providence? I bring you three practical steps, and I pray that you will remember each of those steps. 
Step number one, be clear about doing the will of God where you are. Wherever you are now, you didn't get there by accident. Even if it looks like you got there by accident, you didn't get there by chance. Even if it did look like you got there by chance, you didn't get there randomly. You didn't get there by luck. God permitted it or God caused it directly. So be very clear about doing the will of God where you are now. Be very clear about doing the will of God where you are now. In the book of Esther, Mordecai sent a message to Esther saying, who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this when the Jewish people were being threatened with genocide in Persia, today's Iran, the ancient kingdom of Persia is the country that we know today as Iran. In those days, a particular person of high authority in the kingdom of Persia called Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews across the kingdom. But before then, God had allowed a young Jewish girl called Esther to become the queen as a replacement of Queen Vashti, who misbehaved at the king Ahasuerus or Sexes, removed Queen Vashti and conducted an exercise to find another queen to replace Vashti. And it just happened that the girl that was picked was Esther. It just happened as if randomly, as if by accident, as if by mere luck. It just happened. But we know everything is governed by the providence of God. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by luck. Nothing happens randomly. So, Mordecai, the uncle of Esther, said to Esther, who knows but that you have become the queen because of a time such as this, when Haman was plotting to destroy Jewish people across the old kingdom of Persia. Think about it. Can you just happen to be in the right place at the right time? Is it possible to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Does God control mm. and guide your destiny? Does God control and guide your destiny? Even the people you meet and the places you visit, is God involved? Even the particular times involved, in terms of your relationship with people, the time you meet them, the time you leave them? Do you think it's all random? The answer to these questions is both simple and complex. It is simple because the one word answer is, everything is governed by God's providence. The Bible teaches us that God is not only sovereign. That is, God is not only controlling all things at all times. But more importantly, God is actually guiding events in accordance with his own eternal purposes. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11, the Bible says, God works all things after the counsel of his own will. God actually organizes all things, causes things to happen, permits things to happen in accordance with his own counsels, his own purposes and plans. You see the same thing in Psalm 33 verse 11. 
And in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 13, nothing happens by chance or by accident. What appears to be merely circumstances is really the outworking of God's plans. Look into your own life. Look into the life of everyone in the Bible. Be clear about doing the will of God where you are because you didn't get there by chance. Be clear about doing the will of God where you are because you didn't get there by chance. Nothing happens by mere circumstances. Everything is really the outworking of God's plans. Let me go on. You know, I said you might walk out of the will of God in a particular situation, or God in his mercy might allow you to walk into his will in another way too. You see, we don't have the big picture to know what God is doing and why he is doing it. I will be the first person to let you know that. We don't know what God is doing and why he is doing it. We don't have the big picture. Remember in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9, God says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So it's not easy to determine how far God will allow the sinful man to keep rejecting his will until that sinful man gets completely destroyed. God is gracious. God is loving. God is kind. That's why I'm saying to you, the first practical step to take in order to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence, is that you must be clear about doing the will of God where you are. Be clear about doing the will of God where you are. Do what is good in the sight of God. Do what is right in the sight of God. You can link this back to the first principle. Genuinely loving God and seeking to please him. That will help you to be clear about the will of God where you are right now. We don't know how God is able to permit the evil and cruelty that men work for his own purposes and for his own goals. We don't have the big picture. But thank God that he is gracious. In Romans chapter 11, verse 33, the Bible says, how unsearchable are his judgments how unfathomable are his ways. We can't get to the bottom of what God is doing at any point in time. But please, take this first practical step. Be very clear about doing the will of God where you are right now. You might say, let me walk out of it. I will still be okay. Who knows? You might still be okay. Or who knows? That might be the end. It might happen even as it happened to Judas Iscariot. It might happen even as it happened to the first king of Israel, King Saul. It might happen even as it happened to King Ahab. It's important for us. Take this first practical step. Be clear about doing the will of God where you are right now. We can't always explain the relationship that exists between our prayers and the outworking of God's predetermined plans and purposes. But I want to tell you something. Please, if you want to be clear about doing the will of God where you are, be a prayerful person. Genuinely pray. Ask God to help you to choose what is good in his sight. 
in the situation that you find yourself, ask God. Don't just walk out of the will of God. Ask God to lead you to do what is right in his sight. You will know when you are doing what is right in the sight of God, in the place where you are. You will know. There is a connection, even though we can't explain it. There is a connection between our prayers and the predetermined plans and purposes of God. There is a connection that we cannot explain between our choices, between our decisions, between our actions, and the predetermined purposes of God. There is a connection. Can I help someone today by helping myself first? Be clear about doing the will of God where you are. Be a person who genuinely prays with their spirit, not just with their mouth. Move in the direction of your prayer. If you are asking God to help you to choose what is right, then go ahead. No matter how difficult it is, choose that which is right in the sight of God. Amen. There is a big, big connection between our decisions and the predetermined plans and purposes of God. If it is going to work for you and for me, be very clear that we are doing the will of God where you are. James chapter 5, verse 16. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Believe me, by the grace of God, God has brought me up to follow that rule. The what? The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Amen. And then in Romans 8 verse 28, and we know that God works in all things for the good of those who love him. Amen. For the good of those who love him. So I know that sometimes people want to know what is the big connection between their choices and the purposes of God. So that's why somebody will say, I want to know the will of God. Is this the woman to marry? Is this the man to marry? I want to know the will of God. Must I study medicine or must I study law? I want to know the will of God. Must I seek to leave my country and go to America? or go to the UK. I want to know the will of God. Must I start this trade or go and start another trade? It is because they realize there is a big connection between our choices and the predetermined plans of God. However, I want to help someone today. You don't have to worry about that connection. If you are praying to God, just pray to God. Nothing happens by chance. Pray to God to lead you, and he will lead you. Pray to God to guide you, and he will guide you. Pray to God to make you do what is right in his sight, and he will make you do what is right in his sight where you are. Come and ask me. I am grateful to God. This is very true. This is what God does. This first practical step, being very clear about doing the will of God where you are, matters. It matters. It is far better for us to simply appreciate rather than begin to look for the mysteries about how our choices will feed the predetermined plans and purposes of God for us. Just appreciate where you are. Appreciate the ongoing work of God in your life and be clear about doing the will of God where you are. Psalm 131, Psalm 131, from verse 1 to 3. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my highest lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters 
nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a wind child with his mother. Like a wind child is my soul within me, O Israel, hoping the Lord from this time forth and forever. Always be clear about doing the will of God where you are. Then you can simply trust that God will work things out for you. Be clear about doing the will of God where you are. And then you can simply trust that God will work things out for you. What practical steps must we take to enjoy God's providence? Practical step number two. Cling to God. Cling to God. Cling to who God is, even when you don't understand why you are going through situations that appear to be contrary, to be opposite to his promises for you. Cling to who God is. We won't always understand what God does, why he permits certain things despite our prayers despite our love for him, despite our seeking to please him. We won't always understand what God does when it seems that despite our best efforts, we've made a mistake again. We've made another mistake. We are in another mess. But I want to tell you, you want to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence, cling to who God is. Every time, anytime, everywhere, anywhere, especially when you don't understand why you are going through situations that are contrary, that are opposite to God's promises for you. Job chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. God permitted Satan to destroy the family of Job, to destroy the businesses of Job, to destroy the reputation of Job. God stripped him of everything that God had given Job. God allowed Satan to attack Job. But Job chose to cling to who God is, especially when he doesn't understand what is happening to him. Job chapter 1. Verses 20 to 22. Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. What was Job doing? He was clinging to who God is rather than to what God does. Job chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. When God permitted Satan to destroy the health of Job completely, his wife said to Job, do you still hold fast to your integrity? With all this pain, all this sorrow, all this suffering, curse God and die. But Job said to his wife, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. When you don't understand what God is doing, cling to who God is. There'll be very many foolish voices who are looking at what God is doing when it brings you sorrow or pain or disappointment or grief. When it spoils your reputation, there will be many foolish voices who will say God has abandoned him or abandoned her. But cling to who God is. Don't listen to the foolish voices. So Job said, shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all these, Job did not sin with his lips. Amen. Think of Joseph in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph told his brothers who sold him into slavery. 
who plotted against him, believing that they would not allow the promise of God to be realized in the life of their brother, Joseph. But all that they did only helped Joseph to get to where God wanted him to be. So Joseph in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 says this to his brothers. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Cling to who God is when you don't understand what he is doing. When despite your love, your kindness, when despite everything you are doing to please him, things are not happening in a favorable way towards you. Don't blame Satan. Don't start looking all over the place, rebuking Satan. You don't have anything to do with Satan. You have no relationship with Satan. If you are born again, you have only one relationship, and that is with the Lord God Almighty, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cling to who God is, not to what God does, especially if what you are going through is very strange to the promises of God for your life. You see, many times, God doesn't show himself up front in his dealings with us. Many times we won't be able to see the hand of God directly. God doesn't show himself up front in his dealing with us. He's walking in the background. Yet we can be sure that God is silently and continually at work in our lives to accomplish his good purposes. Be very sure of that. You may not understand what, it, what God does. But please cling to who God is. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Don't look at external things. Don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. If you are constantly walking by what is happening around you, especially when those things are not pleasant. You are going to lose out. You won't enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence. You must constantly cling to who God is. In good times, in bad times, cling to who God is. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. If you are clear that you are doing the will of God where you are, even when things are not panning out for you the way you expect, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cling to who God is at all times, whether it rains or it shines, no matter what you are going through in your life. Cling to who God is. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, the Bible declares to us, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. No matter what you are going through right now, be clear that you are doing the will of God where you are. God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. God is not unjust. So imitate those who through faith and patience obtain the promises. Imitate those who through faith and patience obtain the promises. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, the Bible says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abandoned in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor will never be in vain in the Lord. 
Cling to who God is. Don't quit. Don't ever quit. Don't ever leave God. Don't ever reject God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, may God perfect you, may God establish you, may God strengthen you, may God settle you. Amen. Amen. So I say it again. Cling to God. Cling to who he is, even when you don't understand why you are going through situations that are contrary to his promises for you. Never let go of God. Never quit. Never let go of God. Never quit. Let me come to the final practical step, the third step. Be quick to repent when you miss the mark. Be quick to repent when you miss the mark. Learn how to bring yourself back into favor with man and with God. Learn how to repent. Learn how to plead for forgiveness and do it genuinely. Do it genuinely. Be quick to repent when you have missed the mark. Be quick to repent when you have sinned. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20. For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. We are God's born again children, but we are still human beings. We will miss the mark from time to time, no matter how hard we seek to show our love to God, no matter how hard we seek to please God. There is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9, who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Who can say it? Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? There is no one who does not fall short of the mark of the standard of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why Peter the Apostle was saying to everybody in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted. Change that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When you fall short of the mark, repent, change, be converted, produce behavior that is consistent with repentance, produce the work of repentance, show by your changed behavior that indeed you have repented. Otherwise, you have not. Be quick to repent. Learn how to seek favor from God and from man when you are falling short of the mark. Learn how to do it. Learn how to humble yourself. Learn how to apologize sincerely. Learn how to behave in a way that shows that you genuinely have repented. Think about it this way. In Romans, in uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned when we have sinned, then we make God a liar and his word is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, especially when we have sinned, then we make God a liar and his word is not in us. 
There are many examples in the Bible of people who sinned, and when they genuinely repented, God favored them again. Think of the example of King Manasseh of Judah in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 from verse 1 to 20. King Manasseh of Judah did extreme evil in the sight of God. He did extremely bad things. He killed his own children. He worshipped idols. He brought idols into the house of God. He practiced witchcraft and sorcery. He destroyed everything that his father, Ezekiah, a very well-known king who believed in God, who served God. His father was Ezekiah. Manasseh, the son, destroyed everything that his father Ezekiah had done in his faith for God, in his service for God. So eventually, God allowed Manasseh to be captured by the enemies of Israel and be taken away as a captive. But when in his land of captivity, he repented and regretted all his evil deeds, God restored him. God restored him. God restored him. Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 12. Now when Manasseh was in affliction, in affliction, he prayed to the Lord his God. He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to God, and God received his entreaty, his pleadings. God received his entreaty. Learn how to plead how to beg for forgiveness. God received his entreaty. God had his supplication. Learn how to practice supplication. When you've done something wrong, behave in such a way that shows you truly regret what you have done. And God brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. The Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. What about the example of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon? He sinned against God, so God removed him from his throne. You see the story in the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verses 28 to 37. The book of Daniel, chapter 4, verses 28 to 37. But when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon repented, God restored him to his throne. And so we read in Daniel, chapter 4, verse 34. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Repent quickly when you miss the mark. That is the final practical step. You want to enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence? Be clear about doing the will of God where you are. Amen? Whatever you do, cling to who God is every day, every time, especially when God seems to be doing or permitting things that are opposite to your expectations, that are contrary to the promises of God for your life. God is working in the background to make it all come out good for you. And this final step, there is no one who does not sin. Even though we are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, even though we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we will fall short of God's standard. When we do so, you must learn how to repent and to repent quickly. And you see the examples of those who repented and God restored them. God is more than willing to restore us to times of refreshing, to blessings that we would have missed out on. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless all of us. See, we can enjoy our unlimited God, the God of providence, Events in our lives are not governed 
by chance. Events in our life are not governed by coincidence. Events in our life are not go governed by good luck or bad luck. No, every event in our life is part of God's providential plan for our ultimate blessing. That's where I'm going to finish. Every event in our life is part of God's providential plan for our ultimate blessing. Amen. Let me say thank you to everyone that has watched today's broadcast. Everyone that has listened to today's broadcast. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless you. I love you, for God loves you much, much more. Until another time on this platform, I remain your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Hilary, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye.